Good day, Grade 12s. Welcome to this next lesson. Um, as I mentioned to you yesterday, in this lesson we're going to do, we're going to carry on and finish the question we had on electricity, um, which is this question here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do a whole bunch of old exam paper questions on the work that we've covered so far this um, since we started these lessons. Um, because next week we're doing something slightly different. We're only doing grade 11 and we're doing it in the morning. Um, you're welcome to join us. It is good revision for you guys, I'm pretty sure. Um, but you can watch out for the headlines, the emails, whatever that come out. It will tell you about it. Um, also on Facebook and also on this website platform, it will tell you exactly what we are going to be doing and when and where we're going to be doing it. All right, so let's carry on. In this question, what did we do? It asked us to calculate the resistance of resistor R and we worked it out to be 24 ohms. So let's read that there. Now it says calculate the reading on the ammeter. So let's just remind ourselves where we were at. We have a battery in the circuit. We're presented in the diagram below. It has an internal resistance of R. When switch S is closed, the reading on the voltmeter 2 Voltmeter 2 is 18 volts. The resistance R dissipates 13.5 watts, okay? And it asks us to calculate the reading on ammeter. Okay, fine. So do you agree that with all that information, we can easily work out what the current is in this? And because this is just half the resistance, we can therefore work out the current in that. And then we can add the two and we'll get this current over here. Okay, so remember, because why? Because the current splits. Okay, the current's going to come through here, la, 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 and then split. And then it joins back together and goes through. So if we work out what this current is and that current is, we can add them up and we can find what is going, the current is that's going through the ammeter. So we can either use V equals IR, which is probably easier. So what V is equal to IR, the volts that we worked at will give 18 volts. The resistance that we worked at was 24 ohms. So it's 24 multiplied by the current. I mean, yeah. So therefore I is going to be 18 divided by 24. And do you agree that six goes back into both of them? So it's three quarters is I. So I is going to be 0.75 ohms. So therefore we've got 0.75 ohms coming through this resistor here. But this resistor is half the size. 12 ohms is half the size of 24 ohms. And therefore we can say, well then it's pretty obvious that the resistance, the current going through the 12 ohm resistor has to be what? Well, if the resistance is, is half, then the current is going to be double. Am I right? So therefore we can just go, well, what is 0 0.75 doubled? And I'm really hoping you guys are not going to need your calculators to work that out. And you're going to realize that that is 1.5 ohms. Doesn't matter if you didn't need your calculator, I'll accept it, but it'd be better if you didn't need your calculator. So this is 1,5 ohms. Okay, so then we haven't finished because they want the reading on the ammeter. And the reading on the ammeter is going to be 1.5 plus the 0 0.75 which is going to be five, seven and five is 12, carry one, and yes, that's right. And then for two comma two five, sorry, I had a little bit of a mental breakdown there. So therefore the reading on the ammeter is two comma two five amps. Okay, explain in words what is meant by the term internal resistance. Okay, great. Tolls, one thing I do want to mention to you here is that they've said explain in words what is meant by term internal resistance. They're not expecting you to give the formal definition. It's only for two marks. They said explain in words that don't mean that you have to give the formal definition. If you give the formal definition, it's cool, not a big deal, but don't panic if you can't remember it. So basically the internal resistance is the resistance that the battery has, okay? That's all it is. Internal resistance is the resistance on the inside of the battery. Now it says calculate the potential difference across the 10 ohm resistor. Okay, so now they're saying if we put a voltmeter across the 10 ohm resistor, what would the voltmeter reading be? Okay, well that is pretty easy as well because we now know that the current in the main circuit is 2.25 amps and this is 10 ohms. So I'm just going to change color so it's a new question. I don't understand why it's doing this. Okay, 
So what V is equal to IR, we're again using Ohm's law. We want the V, the current is 2,25, and the resistance is 10. So therefore it is going to be 22,5 volts. So this at the moment is reading 22,5 volts. Okay. Now it says when switch S opened. Okay, when switch S opens, that's no longer there. I'm going to use a yellow to do that. That's no longer there. Okay, it's open. It says the reading on voltmeter V1 is now 49, 45,9 volts. 45,9 volts. So obviously then that is the EMF. So now we have EMF is equal to V plus I R. Okay. Do you agree that we've got the EMF? We've got the total volts to the circuit. It's a 22.5 plus the 18 volts because remember that they're in parallel. And we've got the current. It's 2.25 amps. So therefore we can find the internal resistance. So we can say EMF is 45,9 is equal to this 22.5 plus the 18 plus the current of 2,25 R. Okay, now, okay, that's fine. So therefore it becomes 45,9 is equal to 5, 8 and 2 is 10, carry 1, 2 and 1 is 3, plus 1 is 40 plus 2,25R. So what are we left with? We're left with a 4 and it's 5,4 is equal to 2,25R. So we divide both of these by 2,25. And what are we left with? Therefore, R is equal to what? So we're going to get out our calculators and we're going to go 5.4 divided by 2.25 and we're left with 2,4 ohms, 2,4 ohms. Okay, so whenever you see something like this where they say the switch is opened um, and then you have a reading, then obviously you're getting the EMF. Okay, this is obviously then the EMF. And then you need to use your EMF equation to work out your total internal resistance. Now it says, does the external resistance of the circuit increase, decrease, or remain the same when resistor R is removed? Okay, they're asking what happens to the external resistance, okay? When R is removed, what happens to the resistance? Does the resistance increase, decrease, or remain the same? And again, I'd like to remind you that the more resistors we have in parallel, the smaller resistance. Okay, so what we've effectively done is we've moved a resistor in parallel. So if you look at it, it's actually very easy. The total resistance now is going to be 10 plus 12, which is 22 ohms. Okay, which is bigger than if we had this resistor in parallel with the 12 ohm resistor. So the definite answer is increase. The minute you remove any resistor that was in parallel, you increase the resistance of the circuit. It's very important that you remember that. Okay, right. So now I've started off by looking at just looking at basic exam paper questions starting from the beginning. Um, and this is obviously to do with Newton's laws. And in fact, it's Newton's second law because they've asked us about Newton's second law. But let's just read this. It says a four kilogram block B resting on a flat rough horizontal surface. So if you see the words rough horizontal, what are you thinking? I'm thinking friction. I'm thinking friction. There's going to be friction. Is connected by a light inextensible string to six kilogram block A. The string is passed over a light friction is put in such a way that block A hang, hangs down perfectly. 
Now it says write as Newton's second law of in motion in words. Okay, guys, you're welcome to learn it. It's F net, in fact, you should, is equal to mass times acceleration. Is not the words, it's the equation, the appropriate equation that goes with Newton's second law. Newton's second law basically states that an object will accelerate with an acceleration that's directly proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass. Okay, if there is a resultant force that acts on it. Okay, so there if you go, F net is equal to mass times acceleration. You guys need to go learn your, your laws. Okay, it's a nice two to three mark question. And like I said, it can be up to 10% of your paper is just your laws and definitions. So it's worth learning. Then it says draw a free body diagram of all the forces acting on block B. Okay, on block B. Right. So this is a free body diagram. As soon as you see the word free body diagram, what do we draw? We draw a dot, a big fat dot, or a colored in circle, as one of my students always says, a colored in circle. Okay, what forces do we have? Do you agree we've got the force of gravity? Then we've got the normal force. And then it says, yeah, the four kilogram block resting on a flat horizontal surface. So therefore this force here is the tension. That's that force there, okay? And because the tillus is a rough horizontal table, I can tell you now that there's going to be a force of friction. Okay, force of friction. Okay, so those are your force. That's your force diagram. Now, grade 12 is a couple of things you need to know. Firstly, the normal force and the force of gravity should be equal in size. Okay. If you can't draw it exactly equal in size, then do little lines like you do with maths to show that these lines are equal. Similarly, because it is resting, it is not moving, the tension equals the force of friction. Tension equals the force of friction. Okay. So this is block B. Now it says, the kinetic frictional force experienced by the block B is 32.53 newtons to the left. Calculate the magnitude of the acceleration. Okay, so now it says it's connected to, is resting, blah, 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 blah. the strings, okay, the hangs vertically. Okay, now it seems like this block is moving. So in fact, the force of friction is going to be smaller smaller than the tension, okay? So you can't say that now because now suddenly it's accelerating. So let's just make it smaller. Okay, now it says, the kinetic frictional force experienced by block B is 32.53, 32,53 Newtons, okay? It says to the left, calculate the magnitude of the acceleration. So do you agree that the normal force and the force of gravity cancel out, okay? So that's not causing it to accelerate. The force of friction is being counteracted by the tension, but the tension is to do with this block, okay? And if we look at the six kilogram block, what are the only forces acting on the six kilogram block? The six kilogram block has got the force of gravity acting on it, and it's got the tension in the string. Okay, here's your tension, and here's your force of gravity. Okay. Um, and do you agree that they have to be equal? Okay, otherwise the string is not going to break, is, is, is not going to be taught, okay? So, do you agree that the force that is acting to the right is actually equal to the force of gravity on A? So, therefore we can say... Sorry, it just says calculate the coefficient of the kinetic friction between the surfaces. How will the frictional force... Okay, I'm right. So first of all, what we have to do is work out the force of gravity. So the force of gravity is equal to the mass, which is 6, times by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9,8. So 6 a to 48 carry 4. 6 nines are 56 plus 54 plus 6. Oh, gosh. Okay, 6 a to 48 carry 4. 6 nines are 54 plus 4 is 58. So this is 58.8 newtons, which means that this is 58,8 newtons. 
Right, they now say to us we have to work out the acceleration. So acceleration F net is equal to the sum of all the forces, which is going to be T plus the force of friction. But obviously the force of friction is in the opposite direction, so it's going to be T minus the force of friction, which is going to be 58,8 minus 32,53. And let's just do that on our calculators. So we're going to have 58.8 minus 32.53 equals 26.27. So the net force is 26,27 newtons. But they didn't ask the net force, they asked the acceleration. And we know that F net equals mass times acceleration is 26,27, but the mass is 4. So that is 4. So we can divide both sides by 4. And we get divided by 4 is going to be 6.57. So acceleration is 6,57 meters per second squared to the right. There we go. Now it says calculate the coefficient of the kinetic friction between the surface of the table and the block. Okay, we know that the kinetic friction actually is 32,53 newtons. Okay, but we know that that is also equal to mu kf normal. Mu kf normal. So what they want us to work out is mu k. So it's very easy to do because we just have to work out the normal force. And the normal force is going to be 4 times by 9.8. Because it's equal and opposite to the force of gravity. Therefore, we can say mu k is equal to 32,53 divided by 4 times 9,8. Which is 32,53 over 4 times 9.8, which is 39,2. So we've got 32.53 divided by 32.9 equals Press the SD button, 0.9887. We always run off to two decimal places, it's 0.99. So it's 0.99. So the mu k, the coefficient of friction is 0.99. Now it says, how will the frictional force of the block be affected if the four kilogram block is pulled at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal? All you have to write down is increase, decrease, remain the same. Okay. So now I just want to erase some space stuff so I can draw. So what they're saying is that instead of the pulling force being horizontal to the surface, we're actually going to be pulling it at an angle. Okay, we're going to be pulling it at an angle. So that means that the force would be at an angle of 30 degrees. Okay, so now think about this. What happens now is normally the force of friction equals mu k fn, okay? Because of the fact that the only force acting on it is, other than that is the force of gravity. But now do you agree that fn is actually going to be smaller because there's going to be a force pulling it up? Okay, so therefore the answer is that the force of friction is going to decrease. And why is that? It's because the force, the normal force, decreases. Okay, the normal force is going to decrease, which results in the force of friction decreasing as well. Another way you can think of it is that you're pulling it up away from the ground. So if you're pulling it up away from the ground, you're obviously decreasing the contact with the ground and therefore you are decreasing the frictional force. Okay. Right, let's look at this question. Oh, they love questions like this. 
A ball is projected vertically upwards from the ground at the speed of 18 meters per second. It passes the roof, okay, with height of five meters on its way up and reaches a maximum height at B. On its way down, it strikes the roof at point A as shown and then bounces up. Ignore the effects of air friction. It says write down the magnitude and velocity of the ball at point B, the maximum height of the ground. It says write down the magnitude of the velocity. Okay, the magnitude of the velocity at B is going to be zero. Because remember that at this point, what is happening, it's going slower, 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 slower. Final velocity at this point is zero. And then from zero, it goes speeds up, 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 up again. Okay, so the magnitude of velocity is zero meters per second. Okay, now it says write down the magnitude and direction of the acceleration of the ball at point B. Well, what is the only force acting on this ball during its whole thing, assuming there's no air friction? Okay, the magnitude is the only force acting on it is the force of gravity. So therefore, the magnitude and direction of the acceleration is going to be 9,8 meters per second squared downwards. Okay. Now it says calculate the following regarding the ball. The time it'll take to reach point B above the ground. Okay, so let's write down the information we have. We've got an initial velocity is 18. We're going to choose up as positive, okay? So initial velocity is 18. Our final velocity we've just said is zero. Acceleration is minus 9,8 because that's always towards the ground. And we want the time. So do you agree we got VF equals VI plus A delta T? So the initial velocity is 18, the final velocity is zero, plus the acceleration of minus 9,8 delta T. Therefore, delta T is equal to basically 18 divided by 9,8. And we pop out our calculator and go 18 divided by 9.8 equals, and it's 1.84 seconds. Remember, you always run up to two decimal places. And if you look at this, there's six, is five and bigger, so it's bigger than five, so if it rounds up, so it becomes 1.84. So the time is 1,84 seconds. So this time here is 1,84 seconds. Okay. Now it says the velocity at the instant it strikes the roof at point A. Okay, the velocity with which it hits that at point A. Okay, so what you need to understand is that there are a couple ways we can do this, but the easiest way is to realize that what goes up must come down. Okay, so the velocity that this ball will have as it travels up and gets to this height will be the same as the velocity at which it comes from this height down to this height. Okay. So in other words, we can say that if we were looking just at this bit here, we could work out the velocity at A. Okay, let me show you. So, and I'll prove this to you actually. Do you agree that if I'm looking at this movement here, and again, we're choosing F as positive. Okay, then the initial velocity is 18. The final velocity is what I want. The acceleration is minus 9.8. And the delta x is 5. My height is 5. Okay, now I should get out. I want a vf, the final velocity. I should get a negative velocity because, no, a positive velocity because I've chosen up, okay, as positive. So we're going to say, um, what are our options? We've got vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2a delta x. We've got VF plus VI equals A delta T, delta X equal to VI T plus half. No, okay, this is the one. So we want VF squared. This becomes 18 squared plus 2 times minus 9.8 times by 5. Okay, so let's get out our calculators. And we go 18 squared plus bracket 2 times negative 9.8 
times 5 close bracket equals 226 but now that is squared so we have to square root the answer and we get that doesn't help at all 15.03 so vf is 15.03 meters per second. Okay, now I'm going to show you the other way of doing this, um, which is we can work on how long it takes to get there, and then we could work out the difference in that time. No, that's just too long. Okay, th that is probably the best way to do it. The other way of doing this is we could have worked out, but it takes a very long time. You could work out the time it would take to get from year to year because you know the length of the, the, you know the displacement, you know the initial velocity, you know the acceleration. So you could work out the time. Okay, then you could actually subtract that time from the 1.84 seconds, and that would equal how much time it takes to fall down. Then you have the initial velocity here is zero. You've got the acceleration, you've got the time, so you could work out the final velocity, and I guarantee you're going to get back to 15.03. Okay, now it says they want the total time it takes from the instant it projected to the time it strikes the roof at point A. So obviously they didn't want to do it that other way, they wanted you to do this. Okay, so we want the time it takes to get to point A. So we know that the time it takes to get to point B is 1.84 seconds. Now we want to know the time it takes to get from point B to point A. Okay, so do you agree that our, we're now looking at this motion, okay? But remember, we still chose up as positive, okay? Don't forget that. So our initial velocity is zero. Our final velocity is minus 15,03. Our acceleration is minus 9,8 because we're doing downwards and we're still choosing the positive. And we want the time. We want the time it takes to get there because then we're going to add it to the 1.84. So we're going to go VF is equal to VI plus A delta T. The final velocity is minus 15,03 is equal to the initial velocity of 0 plus minus 9,8 times by delta T. So therefore, we've got minus 15,03 divided by minus 9,8 is equal to delta T. So then if we get out our calculators, we're going to have 15.03 divided by 9.8 equals SC button 1.53, 1.53. So the total that time is equal to 1,53 seconds. But that's not what they asked. They asked what was the total time gets from the ground till it hits the ground. So therefore, we're going to go 1,84 plus 1,53, 4,37. 8 plus 5 is going to be 13 carry 1, um, and that's 337, 3,337, 3,337 seconds. Okay, now it says scratch a graph of the velocity, velocity time graph of the motion of the ball from the ground up until it hits the roof of the building. Okay, right. So we chose up as positive, okay, which means we started with an initial velocity of 18, okay. We then end up with a final velocity of zero, okay. We end up with a final velocity of zero, that's at this point here. And then what happens? And then we go in the opposite direction. Okay, so we keep going up to the time. So it's going to be a graph that does, but not quite as far. And I'm not sure how far that is. We didn't work it out. So, but we know that this final velocity with which it hits the Roof is, what is it, 15.03 downwards, sorry. 
So it says the velocity which okay, so that's gonna be minus fifteen comma zero three. Okay. Oh, it's a terrible graph. Let me just make it straighter. It's supposed to be a nice straight graph. Guys, please use your rulers. Okay, so that's oh it's even worse. It's even worse. Okay, and that time there, we've worked out already is 1.53, 1,53, and that time over there, we've already worked out is, no, I lie. Um, this time here is 1.84. One comma eight four, and this time here is three comma three seven. Okay, so that is a velocity versus time graph. Okay, now it says indicate on your graph the initial velocity tick, the time at point B the maximum height, tick, the final velocity tick. Good, we've done it. Velocity versus time. And there you go. Not too bad. Hey. Right, let's look at this question. This question is a very popular question, great tools. It comes up quite often. Um, they love asking it. They really, really do like asking something along those lines, okay? The reason, because it's work energy and power, and it's also conservation of mechanical energy. And you've got to realize things like that gravity doesn't act across the slope. So they tell you, a box is held stationary at point A. At the top of a plane ABC, incline and angles are horizontal. Fair enough. It says the portion AB is smooth while the portion BC is rough. So it's got friction. Then it says state the conservation of mechanical energy in words. Okay, so obviously conservation of mechanical energy is that mechanical energy is conserved in an isolated system. But what are they telling you by doing that? They're saying that we're going to have to use mechanical energy in order to solve this problem okay mechanical energy in order to solve this problem okay so first of all it says calculate the speed of the box at position b at position b okay so there are two ways that you can do for this you can either think of it as this triangle here being above the ground and just being 0.5 meters above the ground or you can think of it as this thing here being a whole 1.5 meters above the ground and this being one meter above the ground. It really doesn't matter. Either way, you're gonna get the question right if you use mechanical energy, okay? So what we're doing is I'm gonna do it the slightly more complicated way because it's probably the way they would do it on the um, memo, okay? So if you were going through this, you'd understand what I'm doing. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the fact that at A there's only potential energy because it's not moving and at B there is potential energy and kinetic energy, okay? So we're going to go at A, we've got um, EP hang on, plus EK at A has to equal EP plus EK at B, and the reason for this is because of conservation mechanical energy. Now, the potent, or you could use, by the way, you could have also used U plus K is equal to U plus K, right? Either or is fine with me. Okay, right. So now the potential energy at A is made up of all of this, so it's going to be MGH, K plus zero because it's held there, is equal to MGH at a new height plus your half mv squared. What did they ask us this for speed? v squared. Now, do you agree? Now, I know a lot of students will be freaking out at the moment because we aren't told the mass of the box. But do you agree that we can take out a common factor of m here? So this is mgh plus a half v squared. And this is mgh. We can cancel the m's. And now it becomes very easy to solve because we've got GH, but now this is the new original one. So this is going to be 9,8 multiplied by all the height there. So that's going to be 1,5 is equal to the G over here, which is 9,8 
multiplied by this height here, which is only one, plus a half V squared. Okay. So therefore we can say we've got nine comma eight multiplied with 1.5 minus 9,8 multiplied by 1, which equals a half V squared. So let's pop this in the calculator. So you've got 9.8 multiplied by 1.5 equals minus 9.8 equals 4.9. So that's 4.9 is equal to a half V squared. So therefore, we've got 9 comma 8 is equal to V squared. And all we want to do is find the square root of 9.8. And that is going to be 3.13. So V is equal to 3 comma 13 meters per second down the slope. But they've just asked the speed, so you don't have to give direction. Okay, great. Now it says the box experiences kinetic frictional force of 14.7 newtons as it moves at constant velocity. So there's a frictional force backwards of 14,7 newtons. Okay. Then it says state the work energy theorem. So again, they're trying to give you a hint. They're going, look, 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 you're going to be using the work energy theorem. And great tools, I just want to point something out to you. This, these two questions actually came from the same, um, these three questions, one, two, three, came from the same exam paper. Notice the number of laws. 2.1 says, write down Newton's second law of motion in words. Okay, this one admittedly didn't have any theory, but then this one has got two lots. State the principle of conservation of mechanical energy and three, state the a work energy theorem in words. So you can see that there's quite a lot of marks available for pure study work. So please be aware of that and be careful about it. Okay, so it says state the work energy theorem in words, which is just that work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Okay, so network done is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Right, now, so what are they hinting? They're hinting that you're going to have to use the work energy theorem. They, you're going to have to use it. Um, okay, so let's get going with the next bit, which says draw a free body diagram showing all the forces acting on the box at B. Okay, assuming that we now have friction. So remember, it's a free body diagram, but it's on a slope. So I tend to draw the slope in this dotted line to help me find my angles. So do you agree there's a force of gravity down? Fg. End of story. There is definitely a normal force, F normal. There is the force of friction, force of friction. And what else could there be? Okay, it doesn't say anything else about any other forces. There's nothing pulling it down. That's it. So those are your three forces that are acting on it. Now it says use the work energy principle to calculate the distance D between B and C if the box has a mass of three kgs. Oh, sorry, I misread. I didn't even read this bit, how bad a teacher am I? It says the box experiences a kinetic frictional force of 14.7 newtons as it moves a constant velocity down the plane. Okay, now it says, use the work energy principle to calculate the distance D between box B and C and if the box has a mass of three kilograms. Okay, so I need to erase some stuff. Erase, 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 erase. Okay, so we want to use the work energy theorem, okay, which means says that if the if there is a net force, the work done will be on the object and will be directly proportional to the force. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Um, sorry. Um, okay. So what we're saying is that there is a kinetic frictional force and it is 14 comma 7 newtons. But what you guys need to realize is that this force of gravity is broken up into two components. There is 
the vertical component and the horizontal component. And the horizontal component is pulling this box down the hill, whereas the vertical component is obviously just equal to the normal force, so these are equal. Okay, so now what it's saying is that if the work, sorry, if the work energy principle is use the work energy principle to calculate the distance D between B and C if the box has a mass of three kilograms. Okay. So if net multiplied by delta X, I'm going to just do it again. Let me rewrite this. So, sorry, if net is going to be the force of gravity parallel plus the force of friction, okay, which in this case is going to be negative because it's in the opposite direction. So it's if G parallel minus the force of friction, okay, is equal to F net, okay. If G parallel, okay, we don't know. Do we know? It says use the working to calculate the distance D between the box B and C for the mass of three kilograms. We also know that the force of friction is equal to mu K F N. And we know the force of friction is, okay. Right, grade 12, so we're going to carry on with this question in the next lesson, which is on not Monday. It's Monday week, okay? Please remember grade 12s that, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I would like to carry on with this question, but it is a nice question. We need to think about it and do it properly for you. Um, what we need to do is next week, like I told you, next week there's going to be lessons, but they're going to be, um, in the morning and it's for grade 11. So please watch the space and we'll let you know what's happening. Cheers.